Welcome to Decision Analyst Insider Series webinar on maximizing the value of conjoint studies with qualitative. My name is Christy Allen. I am the Marketing Director at Decision Analyst and the moderator today. Before I introduce our presenters, I have a few notes for everyone. In the handout section, there are some relevant white papers and case studies av available for everyone to download. Also, please feel free to ask questions by typing in the chat box. We will attempt to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. If we don't answer your question during the webinar, someone will respond to your question within a day or two. Today's presenters are Shoresh, the Business Insights Manager at Pella Corporation. Shoresh is involved in consumer studies, market data analytics, and application of market research enabling strategic planning and execution of product launches and brand market programs. And Mike, a Vice President from Decision Analyst, is co-presenting. He has over 15 years of experience in designing and executing custom quantitative research. His background includes designing of conjoint, segmentation, and volumetric forecasting research. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Mike. Thank you, Christy, and thanks everyone for uh, joining us this afternoon. I hope this uh, presentation is insightful and educational for you. Uh, I think a lot of our audience is probably familiar with uh, depth interview research, qualitative research, and webcams and um, at least has a basic understanding of conjoint and discrete choice uh, studies. So we're not going to talk a whole lot today about the uh, nuts and bolts of conjoint design and the, the programming that goes on uh, in the back room for that. Uh, what we really want to focus on today is using qualitative research to really help uh, refine a conjoint study and make it uh, actionable and, and really cover all of the bases when you're doing a conjoint analysis. And uh, our presentation today is really around the Windows category with uh, Suresh from Pella on here. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Suresh now. Thanks, Mike. Uh, good afternoon again to everyone who's joined us. And uh, I wanted to quickly touch on the scope of the project as we set to uh, doing this research and essentially the business objective uh, was to uh, help our product team with the portfolio optimization. And some of the uh, key research questions that we were trying to address was really around how do customers comprehend various product offerings today from Pella, you know, uh, and also does each of these product lines have a well-defined USP and what are those product attributes, hierarchy of importance to customers, and uh, also very importantly, um, as we'll illustrate to you a little later, what's important to homeowners versus trade professionals as we think about these product attributes. Uh, so given that scope, uh, we thought that it might be good before we get to the um, how we designed the research and executed, and Mike will walk through those details. Um, it will be helpful for some of you uh, who are not from this industry or familiar with this one to get the context around what the market looks like and what might be the interactions and customer journey be here. So very quickly looking at the market as you see on the slide here, uh, it is a very long tail. Uh, what I mean by that is there are the top brands, about five or eight of them that account for about half the market, and then you have hundreds of players who account for the rest of the uh, market. And so that results in a real long tail, which is also implies that it's so fragmented. Uh, the other aspect to uh, our industry is really you have players of all kinds, not just in terms of size, but also in terms of the offerings. So um, at one end of the spectrum, you would have a national player that offers windows and doors across multiple material and of different product lines. You know? And then you may have players who also have other businesses besides windows and doors. They could be in siding, roofing. So they have a much more diversified portfolio and uh, they also happen to be selling windows and doors. And right at the other end of the spectrum, you have very small local players who might just be offering a single product line and could be just a single material like vinyl windows, or somebody could be just be very specialized and doing aluminum. So, so that's again a very uh, uh, 
uh, speaks to the nature of this industry that's fragmented. And then you have this regional space that influences the choice of the products that are being bought. So again, depending where uh, consumers are living, uh, that kind of dictates the type of windows, the operating types, so whether it's double hung, single hung, or sliding window, and also the kind of materials. So down south, you would have more of the aluminum, whereas in the Midwest, you have wood, and so is the case in Northeast. And, and some of it is as well dictated by the um, style of homes. So, so, so that's the context of the market. And if I get to the uh, way people get, buy a brand or products, they have multiple uh, options. So how do manufacturers of windows get their products to homeowners? And there are more than one way where that happens. So they could either go through a specialty dealer. So that's looking at a uh, manufacturer who has a specialized showroom or uh, somebody who can uh, sell it or have the consumers walk into their showrooms and make a selection. The other option could be the lumber stores. So uh, this could be a lumber yard or a large pro dealer. And the third option could be people going to big box, which could be Lowe's or Home Depot, and then other retailers like Ace and you know those, those kinds. And then you have the possibility of either the homeowner directly going to some of these channels or they engage a builder, a remodeler, or a replacement contractor to go and get it from any of these channels. So you really see a, a kind of a matrix out here in terms of how the products get into the customer's homes. Moving on to the how the customer journey might be, how do they make the decision? That is, again, uh, not very uh, linear. That's kind of sometimes very complex. Right? So uh, again, uh, the process doesn't really start at one particular place and move linearly to getting the product or buying it. Uh, and the customer could be checking the magazines or media or talking to a contractor, simultaneously uh, searching for these products online or even having an exposure by visiting uh, a home improvement store or a, a specialty dealer showroom. The builders could be um, exploring or checking out the product options at a trade show, and some of it could be through uh, reviews that they read on the social media. So clearly it's a very complex and nonlinear um, journey that the customers undertake to get a product into their home and make the choice. So given that complexity uh, and keeping the market and industry dynamics we had to design the study, and that influenced how decision analysts went about it. So Mike, you can walk us through the rest of the design and execution of this project. Yeah, certainly. Thank you, Suresh. So a complex product category with residential windows. And so how did we address this uh, product category that, again, is um, complex across a number of different stakeholder groups? And just uh, as an example of that, um, if you're not a, a builder or a Windows installer, you're probably not familiar with a lot of the uh, aspects and features um, for residential windows. Things like the um, head jam, interior profiles, um, things like standard sash thickness, uh, removable grills, um, interior profiles, and different levels and options within each of these uh, attributes of windows. Others are more familiar for homeowners, like uh, I think we all know what double and triple pane means, uh, blinds between glass, and uh, some of those uh, more familiar aspects. Uh, we did talk to a couple of uh, different segments uh, in this research, uh, the builders and the contractors, installers, and also homeowners, and we'll get to some of that uh, detail in just a moment. So how did we address this complex product category from a research standpoint? Uh, really, it was a um, three-step process. Uh, the first step was doing some real good, rigorous, qualitative research. And these were uh, IDIs, or, or depth interviews, that were done using webcam uh, phone methodology. So we could see all of our survey participants, our, our uh, interview participants, live, and we could uh, 
not only, uh, of course, hear them and hear their reactions, but we could see the expressions on their face too, which uh, webcam really gives you the advantage of doing that. Um, the other advantage of doing a phone webcam versus in-person depth interviews, of course, is getting a more national read on your audience. And as Suresh alluded to earlier, this category uh, can differ a lot by different regions. And um, folks in California have different needs for Windows versus people in Florida and Texas in the Northeast. So this was really, um, I don't want to say our only option, but it was really an efficient way to get a national uh, read uh, during this qualitative phase. We did a lot of qualitative interviews for this. We did, uh, I believe it was 24 uh, in-depth interviews among homeowners and another 24 among installer contractors and home builders. Step two was uh, using those qualitative findings to help refine and develop our quantitative survey instrument. Um, so this involved uh, a work session at, uh, at the Pella offices with Suresh and his team, a day-long work session. Uh, to really hammer out a, a good actionable conjoint design using the qualitative findings. Um, this is a, a step that's highly recommended when you're using a, an approach like this, um, rather than kind of going back and forth through emails or a conference call around people's schedule, really um, scheduling the time and dedicating a day for an in-person meeting um, to, to um, refine the conjoint instrument and just grab everybody's attention for a day, it really um, help the process here. And of course, step three was our conjoint survey. And of course, uh, really using the qualitative findings to refine that, uncover uh, some areas that we hadn't thought about, um, understanding the language that the uh, builders and contractors use as well as the homeowners. So we really wanted the survey to be respondent friendly, for lack of a better term, uh, for both segments. So why did we decide to, to do qualitative at all in this process? You know, a lot of times uh, we'll do conjoint and discrete choice studies without any, any qualitative at all. And uh, sometimes that's driven by budget concerns, timing concerns, or the category uh, is not as complex. Uh, but in this case, it was really almost a, a essential to do so. Um, and so why did we use qualitative here? We wanted to assess homeowners' understanding of the category. Uh, we wanted to know um, what features and aspects they had heard of, how they talk about different window aspects. Uh, we also wanted to understand homeowners' preferences. And of course, this is still in the qualitative phase, and uh, so we, we developed some uh, general rankings of preferences and attributes and, and levels to use in the conjoint here. But again, uh, from a qualitative sense and not from a quantitative sense, that's what the conjoint study is for. So I wanted to understand homeowners' preferences. We wanted to know what's important in the homeowners' uh, words and in the builder and contractor's words. How do they talk about things when they're talking about important features of Windows? So we heard things, of course, about, and this is just a, a quick snapshot here, but we heard things about price and how important it is relative to quality, uh, how important it is for Windows to be uh, energy efficient, noise reducing. And uh, of course, the qualitative helps simplify the category prior to doing quantitative. So we were able to use this to kind of speak in the language of homeowners and builders and uh, Windows installers. As mentioned before, we also interviewed 24 um, trade pros prior to doing the quantitative phase, and this included contractors and home builders, both groups. Um, we wanted to understand their language and how it differed from the homeowners, and also importantly, assess differences in how they rank the importance of different attributes and features of Windows when compared to homeowners. And here, um, again, using the webcam approach, you can share stimuli with respondents and participants. And here on the uh, lower right here is just a quick example of some of the stimuli. Um, there was uh, quite a bit more that we, we shared during the 45 minutes, but just an example of stimuli we share uh, with the pros. So using the qualitative research to steer the conjoint design, again, we wanted to make sure the language made sense to both audiences uh, and make sure all of our bases were covered. Uh, because of the differences in how each segment uh, looks at the category of Windows, uh, we wanted to develop two different designs here and two different models. So um, when we got to the quantitative phase, uh, we had two different uh, paths to take. If they were a contractor, installer or a home builder, they went down one path. And if they were a homeowner, they went down another path. Uh, very similar questionnaires. The conjoint task itself differed in some ways. 
Uh, one of the real benefits of doing the, the qualitative phase was developing this uh, respondent uh, glossary for them to access during the uh, discrete choice exercise. So before we uh, took them through the discrete choice module, uh, we showed them a detailed glossary that included lots of uh, pretty images of windows and lots of explanation on what different features meant, uh, what what the different aspects were, uh, along with some definitions. So we could define what um, sash thickness and interior stepped profile and things like that were uh, before showing the homeowners the, the task. And throughout the discrete choice task, they could reference this glossary at any point. And that's, um, I think, very important when you're designing a conjoint study and, and executing a good thorough discrete choice study, you want to have a glossary available for respondents, whether it's rudimentary or a little more complex like we had here, um, for them to always access during the task. Otherwise, um, you get some confusion and you get some, and you get some data that, that doesn't make sense at the end of the day. So we wanted to capture everything that the homeowners might consider. And of course, the glossary made the task more user friendly. And also in the choice task, uh, we gave our participants the ability to hover over certain attributes and, like I mentioned before, refer back to the glossary, but um, they could hover over using their mouse uh, certain aspects in the choice task to get a more detailed definition. And we, we made sure to mention that if they were confused by anything to hover over an item and it would pop up a definition for them to, to get more clarity there. Um, we actually um, get some feedback at the end of surveys from respondents and um, in, in really got you know, some comments back that, about how easy the task was and um, how it was helpful to have these definitions during the choice task. Um, as I alluded to a moment ago, we had a customized survey design for each segment, that being homeowners and pros, um, customized glossary for each segment that was really um, geared in the um, appropriate language for each segment. So some little tweaks for the homeowners versus the uh, installer contractors and home builders. So how did we use the uh, data that came out of our conjoint exercise? Uh, this is just an example here of how we quantify what's important to each segment. And this chart um, has the uh, categories and attributes kind of hidden here, but this was an analysis to um, help explain what homeowners were willing to pay more for versus the incremental preference. And so, of course, price was part of the conjoint task, and we use that as part of this analysis here to kind of map out what's important and what they're willing to pay more for. And, of course, this analysis was done by each of our key segments. Another example here of um, just reporting what's important to each segment, uh, it differed somewhat by our, uh, our two key segments, homeowners and the trade pros. So using the data out of this uh, conjoint and the modeling, uh, Suresh and his team you know, can really use this uh, modeling and, and uh, the survey results to target each audience and communications and, and marketing efforts. Um, another deliverable, um, as some of our audiences uh, I'm sure are familiar with, is a simulation tool that comes out of a, a discrete choice study. So this uh, tool really allowed Suresh and his team, and they're using it on an ongoing basis, to run what if what if scenarios uh, in the category, um, looking at different pricing levels and uh, different uh, levels of all the attributes we tested here, in terms of demand. Uh, and this, by the way, the simulation tool was prepared for for both segments. So there's a separate tool for the homeowners and a separate one for the trade pros. So with that, I'll let Suresh talk just a little bit here about the journey forward and how he and his team um, have been using the the survey results. Thanks, Mike. So um, this is a work in progress, and the project is still on, on stream. So um, I'm sorry, I won't be able to get into a very specific details uh, in terms of results as yet. But um, you know, clearly uh, the survey and the research findings helped us a lot to get a better sense of the value perception of current product lines and what the attribute hierarchy were in terms of price value equations. And, and that uh, certainly helped inform the uh, product team to move forward with the uh, product portfolio optimization, which was the basic business objective uh, when they kicked off this project. Um, and uh, the simulator, which uh, Mike just showed earlier, 
has also helped us in terms of understanding uh, what the preferences are like and what the uh, brand share impact would be as a result of that, including cannibalization. And so um, that again has uh, provided us with a better direction, how do we go about with this optimization uh, portfolio of work. Uh, so overall, I think where it stands is really um, a project that's moving along, moving along well from uh, getting the customer understanding, but of course, as most of you might know, that this is one part of it. It really uh, has to work in tandem with you know, the other elements, like the operational and financial aspects uh, that needs to be uh, blended in with uh, the uh, these findings. But our objective today, and hopefully um, what you might have picked from all that we walked you through, is how to really get a better conjoint design done um, and using, you know, the qualitative element. And uh, we appella thought that rather than going into the conjoint survey uh, with a design, with assumptions, uh, and thinking that we know all the attributes that our customers typically apply in their decision making, um, we decided we have that qualitative module in place, and that helped us to actually a validate some of our assumptions, but more importantly, also introduce certain attributes, and also helped us to really discern and kind of design it in such a way that we separated the consumer and the professional pieces of the research in a manner that uh, came back with much better results. So, so that's how I would define as a great value, and hopefully uh, you can adapt it to uh, what we shared. So that, I think, uh, we're open to questions, I guess, Mike. Okay, yeah, thank you, Suresh. So we've got a couple of questions here. Uh, one, I think, is for me, and one might be better answered by you, Suresh. The first one is, uh, uh, where do you find the builders and contractors to do the, the research, both from the qualitative and the quantitative? Uh, well, we have a, a panel here internally at Decision Analyst of contractors. Uh, they're not uh, flagged necessarily by what type of contracting they do, whether they're window installers or door installers or roofers, et cetera, but just a general contractor panel. We use that panel to uh, recruit from, and we also have some large panel partners that we use that have these uh, segments defined. Um, so we were able to uh, get a good representative sample from those sources. Uh, Suresh, I think the next question I've got here might it might be better for you. Um, how much innovation is occurring in the category, and what's the speed of innovation? How fast is the category changing in terms of uh, product features and, and benefits? Yeah, great question. So, um, yeah, you know, typically windows and doors don't see much of innovation uh, for a long period of time because, you know, it's the nature of category there. Um, People look at it just as another opening, in, and it's a glass and frame. But uh, with the changes in technology that have uh, been happening around us, we've seen some innovations come into this category as well, and especially um, more around the uh, smart home technology. So that's um, bringing in some innovations around dynamic glazing, about operating windows uh, remotely, and you know, things of that sort, so that's kind of innovations that are happening. And um, I, I think the manufacturers are also looking at uh, different materials, as material technology is also um, evolving. So those would be the kinds of innovations that are happening in the industry today. Okay, very good. And I, I, th I think it also speaks to the benefit of um, using um, qualitative here and doing the, the depth interviews among the professional segment because you hear some things that might be happening out there in the market and, and some things they he they're hearing from salespeople at, at places like home improvement stores and specialty window shops. And you kind of hear that conversation that's going on out in the market um, and you hear about some innovative things that may not be under development necessarily, but uh, just uh, some innovations that are being talked about out in the market nowadays. Uh, don't uh, think we have any more questions here. So, uh, Christy, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. 
Thank you everyone for attending. If you have any questions, feel free to email Mike or Suresh. Our next Insider Series webinar will be held on August 15th with the topic of usability studies. The presenters will be Clay Detloff and Roger Wallace. And thank you again, everybody, for attending, and have a wonderful rest of the day.